with our lecture today. So today we're talking about shape. Last week we talked about line in fashion. So the line is the edge of something. Shape is what's in the middle or maybe even what's on the outside of that edge. But for us in fashion, we're going to talk about shape, which is synonymous with silhouette. So I'm going to share my screen with you now and start to show you some of the slides. And I'm going to give you a bit of a fashion history lesson today, as well as talking about silhouettes themselves, because it is actually quite difficult to talk about silhouettes without talking about history. So let me share my screen and we'll see how we go. shape in fashion. So here we have a diagram of a whole lot of silhouettes, definitely not all of them, but a whole lot of silhouettes through the whole history of dress, not just Western dress, but for example, this first one is an Egyptian silhouette. And then we go through and we can see the shapes changing because if you only look at the shape, it's very easy to see the changes in a, in a very simplified way. You can see the skirts getting more ample in 1600, sticking right out at the sides, very big collars. You can see more of a back silhouette here in 1670. 1750, they're absolutely enormous. Everything is loose and comes from the shoulders rather than from the waist. 1780, it's look a little bit shorter there and a bit of a bustle going on. 1800, very slender. That was when the empire line began, which we'll talk about soon. Back into the 1850s, huge skirts again, lots of frilly sleeves. 1900, the end of the Victorian era, Still a little bit of a bustle effect going on here and lots of leg of mutton sleeves or gigo sleeves, which we'll also talk about later on. 1920s, everybody knows the flapper dresses, little tubular dresses. We'll be talking about tubes in a minute. 1940, the war. Fabric was very scarce during the war. Women weren't allowed to buy 10 meters of fabric to make an amazing evening dress. So things became very short, little knee length dresses with a waist and very practical because most women, as I said, were out working. Then when the war ended, famously Dior started his new look in 1947 with these huge skirts with petticoats underneath, in many ways, almost going back to 1850, except of course, much shorter but he did a lot of evening gowns as well that were very reminiscent of the 1860s and 70s. And there was a riot because in a lot of places, France had been occupied during the Second World War. England was still having rationing in 1952. And when he came out with this extravagant new look, there were riots in the streets because women weren't allowed to buy fabric to make those clothes. And all of a sudden, those women who were still wearing their dresses from during the war looked very, very dowdy compared to these splendid, very extravagant clothes that Dior was showing. But nonetheless, by the middle of the 1950s, most women had adopted this new look. It was not a very practical look and it required a huge amount of maintenance. The youth quake that happened in the 1960s, the first time that that really young, young people actually found a huge voice in society. And these very, very tiny little tubular dresses, a little bit like the 20s, but shorter and, and even narrower, became very fashionable. Then in the 70s, the hippie era with the flares, the flared long tunic tops. In the 1980s, all of a sudden, there was power dressing. Women were really worth going into the corporate world more than they ever had and wanting to look strong and powerful. Shoulder pads became an enormous thing. And you'll see when we see the slides that it really, really altered the silhouette. In the 90s, there was minimalism. Things became much more somber, much leaner, much softer, 
a lot of very neutral colors, a lot of very soft drapey fabrics and a much, a much less um, powerful style, but also a much less female style, very androgynous sort of look. And then in the 2000s, well, that's the silliest silhouette I've ever seen because the 2000s had so many different silhouettes. In the 2000s, everything got mixed up and it was open slather. And a designer might have six different, completely different and contradictory silhouettes in one season. Or the silhouettes from one designer to another might change randomly from one season to another. So let's have a look now. I'm going to go by shape. I'm going to, well, the lecture's about shape, isn't it? I'm going to go by each different shape and show you a little variety. We haven't got enough time, unfortunately. I'd love to, I'd love to just take you through the entire history of fashion and take five days. But as far as I can, I'm going to take you a little bit through the history of dress and how it has changed. Now, I'm only talking at this moment, I'm afraid, about Western dress. I'm talking a little bit about men's, but mainly about women's because the women's silhouettes by Suzanne Conrad. She was a dressmaker, actually, not a famous couturier in the 1920s. And she did the most beautiful, very unusual beading, as you can see here, using or even weaving using ribbon. Let's look first at the tube or the oblong shape, which is the most simple of all of the silhouettes, of course, because it's just two lines, two straight lines with a top and bottom. So this is one of the most basic silhouettes and it goes in and out of fashion with various different iterations. This first photograph is a dress by Mario Fortuny, an Italian designer who was working in the 1910s and this was a very radical dress for its era. He invented this beautiful crinkled pleating technique and that was what defined very many of his clothes. He often put beautiful little beads around the edges of them so that they looked like a little uneven dotty line. Quite beautiful jewels. This is a very, very early representation of what he did. And when it first came out, it was so radical that women were too embarrassed to wear it on the street. They, they felt too exposed because until this time, they'd all been in corsets and they'd been wearing high necks and ruffles and big sleeves and big skirts. And you can imagine how, how you would feel that your body had become much more visible wearing something like this, even though it isn't actually figure hugging. Anyway, by the 1920s, this, this silhouette had completely come into mainstream fashion, but a lot shorter with the flapper dresses. And the dress on the right by Suzanne Conrad, who's not a famous couturier at all, she did weaving. You can see she's used a kind of net and raffia to weave this beautiful dress. There were a series of her dresses in the book that I found, and it's so simple. And when you've got a very simple shape like this, it makes a great canvas for surface decoration. So she has completely reinvented the tube in this beautiful way. And you can see the white line going up around the bust and down towards the waist gives the effect of there being shape to the, to the dress, even though when you look at the sides, it's really quite simple and straight. Fast forward to 1967 and here we are with Pierre Cardin, whose name you probably have heard because he's one of the most famous designers ever. He was a complete futurist and he absolutely started a revolution with his clothes. There was, they were so short. So don't forget this came after the 50s when everyone had been wearing cinched waists and great big skirts with petticoats underneath them. And all of a sudden, here they were with their legs completely exposed. So tights became a very important um, piece of fashion accessory. And look at the gloves that match the dresses. Aren't they fantastic? And how about those helmets? They just look so good, even today. When you think about how long ago it was and the color palette is really beautiful. So he specialized in these really, really ultra simple, very graphic designs. 
So tubular clothes really went out in the 70s when people started wearing flares and flared dresses and things that had waists again. The waist became really important in the 70s. In the 80s, we had the power suits. Let's, let's look at Ray Kawakubo from Comte des Garçons, 1997, so 30 years later, a very different iteration of the tube dress. And of course, because it's Ray, there is this extraordinarily unusual padded wrap that goes halfway around the waist and hangs down the front. But nonetheless, the basic form of the dress is still a tube. Sided shape, the box. The box in fashion has also come in and out. It wasn't really something that was used very much until the 1920s. The examples I've got here are the most famous one is the Yves Saint Laurent Cabin jacket, which was taken from the jackets that the sailors used to wear. Yves Saint Laurent did the first Cabin in 1962, and in 2021, they're still doing something very, very similar. It's such a classic style, navy blue with brass buttons. Of course, there've been lots of different iterations, but for a real Cabin jacket, it has to be square, oversized, navy blue, and buttons down the front, double-breasted buttons down the front. Let's just look on the right next at Claude Montana. I'm afraid I don't have the date, but sometime in the 80s. This is an absolutely typical example of the kind of a felt cloak with the zips on the sides, but it's the perfect example of the box. And then here we are with RAF for Prada Men's in 2021, the navy blue. Um, sleeveless distressed jumper with all the badges on it. Oops. So the shape that I've chosen to show you after the box and the oblong is the egg. So obviously smaller at the top and bottom and bigger at the sides. That was a shape that was also very typical of the late 1910s, very early 1920s. It came back again on the right-hand side in 1950. This is a Balenciaga jacket from the 1950s. And you can see a little bit on that jacket how it was constructed. If you can see, it's got side panels that go in and out following the, following the silhouette. And then there's another seam across the center of the back, which is which has made it into a completely three-dimensional egg shape. We'll have a look at, at those sorts of shapes when we do draping on the dolly in the next few weeks. But that's a shape that completely denies the body. It's almost, it's almost the opposite of the hourglass silhouette that we often typically think of as a, um, like a princess Barbie dress. So it undefines the waist, it undefines the bust. The only emphasis is on the neck and on the hemline, wherever that happens to fall. Here are some more. This is Mark Jacobs from quite recently. I think it was like 2018 or 2019. So a lovely flowing egg shape. Here's a cape from 1840, almost the same shape. And this wonderful cape from Pierre Cardin, this little cape coat from Pierre Cardin, where the shape of the decoration mimics the shape of the garment itself. It looks like a drawing of a garment, but actually completely functional. And some more egg shapes because I love them. Cocoon, whoops, cocoon shapes because I love them. This little romper looks so modern. It looks like it could have been made this year. It was made by Claire McArdle in 1950. She was an American designer, one of the really early sportswear designers. So America became famous for what we call sportswear, but it's not what we think of as sportswear or active wear now. Sportswear in those days was more what you wore when you weren't at work, what you wore on the weekend, what you wore for a picnic what you wore to watch sport maybe, but definitely, definitely not functional sportswear. 
so she made lots of great little shorts suits and a lot of her clothes had mat matching little babushka scarves she's really worth looking at she she was a wonderful designer very far ahead of of the curve and very modern in her day witness this beautiful little play suit she also made a lot of mother daughter clothes so she would make children's clothes and then make the grown ups equivalent Sorry, I don't know who made the outfit in the middle here, but I loved those cocoon shaped shorts. He's got like cocoon sleeves and cocoon shorts. I'd say it might've been in the eighties by, by the um, sneakers that he's wearing though. And here is Balmain from 2021, also men's, very, very egg shaped trousers. He had tons of egg shaped trousers in his collection this year. It's a fantastic space collection. It was, um, it was mounted in an aircraft hangar, an Air France aircraft hangar. And I really recommend that you have a look. How great are those combat boots? So these cocoons are sort of lower body cocoons, if you like. They don't start at the neck and finish at the hem. They start more, well, Claire's starts at the bust, but the others start more at the waist. So cocoon doesn't have to be something from the very top of the body to the hem of the garment. It can be just a section of the garment. So the, the hourglass next is the really typical, what we all really typically think of as sort of the female silhouette because it's bigger at the bust, smaller at the waist and bigger over the hips again. So an hourglass can always goes in towards the waist. It can stay fairly, fairly straight at the under the waist, like that Galliano, that 1990s Galliano, amazing skirt and jacket, or this corset. Or it can simply be something that isn't very wide that's been belted, like the jacket on the left hand side, the yellow jacket. And an hourglass silhouette, although it follows more the female form, can definitely be something that um, men can wear as well. This Versace Vava -va Voom dress with all the safety pins from the 1990s is more a sheath really than an hourglass. But I didn't make a separate category for sheaths because I think they all fit together and it starts to get really difficult to separate them. All of these, all of these silhouettes have extremes where they're an exact example of what they are. And then there are lots of grey areas where it could be one silhouette or it might be another silhouette. And in the end, it's pretty arbitrary, but it is good to be able to sort of define what you're talking about by being able to use these terms. So here are some hourglass silhouettes that have a full skirt. There's the new look in the centre, the Dior new look that I was talking about with the very cinched waist. They called them wasp waists and you could buy what they called waspies, which were little tiny, basically corsets, but they only went a few inches above the waist and a few inches below the waist. Every now and then there was one that had a bra built into it, but they made your waist much smaller, just the way the Victorian corsets did, but without quite so much agony. And so everybody had this very nice, neat, nipped in waist look. And here's a beautiful Balenciaga one. I don't have the date. It must have been the early 50s. Amazing construction. Again, I don't know whether you can actually see it, but there's a seam across the hip line against those against two of the panels that makes it actually three-dimensional. It makes it actually stick out in a point, which you can see on the left-hand side of the silhouette. So it comes to a point there. And then on the side of that point, there's a seam to another point at the back, a horizontal seam. And Molly Goddard's very beautiful denim. I don't know if it's a skirt and top or a dress from 2020 with a lovely neat waist, a voluminous top. So a lot of these hourglass silhouettes don't have a very voluminous top, but this is still what I would consider to be hourglass because it still comes very far into the waist and then out again by the hem. Mm. I did want to just mention A-line silhouettes because they're another very simple silhouette. The Jill Sander one on the right is a beautiful example of a modern A-line silhouette, a, a floor length one. And then this 
Galvin on the left is a very typical little late 90s, early 2000s, nothingy mini dress where the fabric is really doing all the talking. The Jill Sander one isn't quite so plain. It would have looked pretty ordinary if it had just stopped above that frill. But because there's that surface interest above the frill, it looks a little bit more interesting. So in a, in a silhouette like that, either the surface decoration or the construction or the fabrication tends to play the dominant role the same as it does with a, any very simple silhouette. So for example, that Golvin dress, the sequined orange fabric didn't need interrupting very much. It certainly didn't want any complicated seam lines. So it's just got side seams and it's just, and a bust dart. The, the most um, minimal amount of construction that you could manage. It comes in and out, not very regularly. If you look at this beautiful original bell-shaped crinoline petticoat in the center on the drawing of the girl, you can see why, because it's not very practical. Of course, by 1950, when it came back again, it was a little bit more practical because it was a bit shorter, but still there were a lot of petticoats under there holding it out. And what about the Yves Saint Laurent dress here in 2018? It, it looks like it must also have a huge amount of stiffening in it, but I don't think anyone now would wear the layers and layers of petticoats, and certainly we wouldn't be wearing the frame that the girl in the middle has got on. The bell shape isn't all extreme. If you look at Grace Kelly's beautiful wedding dress, it was made by Christian Dior, by, my, by Yves Saint Laurent, sorry, for Christian Dior, because Yves Saint Laurent worked at Dior when he first started designing. He won a prize and he started working at Dior. And then if you look at Audrey Hepburn, that is also a Dior dress. So that little bell-shaped dress actually comes in at the bottom of the waist. So in some ways, it's not really a true bell, but it was described that way. And then there are hybrids of bell shapes. So this Paul Poiret dress, this beautiful creation, has got a sort of lantern with a narrower skirt underneath. And so has the outfit on the right hand side, which has a long tunic jacket that has a bell shaped silhouette at the sides and then a tube skirt underneath. If you don't know who Paul Poiret is, then I suggest that you have a look because he was a designer in the 1910s, as it says then, and he was a complete rebel and a sybarite. He loved dressing up. He loved playing games. He started a whole school for young girls from the country in France called the Martin School, who would come into, come into his atelier and live there. And they had very naive styles of drawing. And he wove carpets, made cushions, had perfume bottles. He had an entire empire. But he loved, he loved um, playing dress-ups and having balls and staging all kinds of productions. And in the end, he lost all his money, even though he made a lot of money in his life. He lost it all because he just didn't manage it very well. And here is another hybrid. This this time the narrow part is on the top and the bell's at the hem. The Bouesseur were very one of the early couturiers in Paris in the 1920s, very romantic, and the precursors to Madeleine Vionnet, who came along after them. Have a look at the beautiful little undergarment on the left-hand side and the frame that, that is incorporated into it. And then there must be a similar kind of a garment under this dress on the right, this very fine, delicate lace dress. So even though it's so wide at the sides, it's got the most, the fine lace and the fact that you can see through it gives it a really quite a sinuous and very delicate feeling. And here's some more reverse bells where the bells at the little bells at the bottom but the torso is really long. The one on the right is by Jean Lanvin. 
in 1921. So Lanvin was a, she lived from the 18, she was making clothes from the 1890s onwards. And I'd love you to see some of the history of that house because when we think about Lanvin today, we think about something very different. We, we mainly think about the time when Albert Elbaz was the director of Lanvin until about 2013 or so. And it had a huge resurgence but she was a very famous couturier in her own right. She also made mother and daughter dresses, but she didn't change fast enough for fashion. So this, this dress in 1921, she could have moved on from that dress and gone fully into a flapper kind of style, but instead she kept the full skirt and she didn't want to let go of it and she didn't like short clothes and she basically lost a lot of her status because she just didn't evolve. I should imagine that everybody knows what an empire line is because there have been so many around in the last five or ten years. The only modern one I've got here is by this beautiful Colombian designer, Agua. So she gets her Colombian embroiderers to do all the embroidery on the bodice of the dress where it's white. It's all hand embroidered, the most beautiful embroidery. If you, if you do a close-up, you can see it. But it really looks like something that could have come from the 19th century, from the early 1800s. So the Empire Line name came from the fact that when Napoleon conquered France and was the emperor, hence empire, his wife, Josephine, wore these high-waisted, very simple, often white dresses, very, very fragile and romantic. And this is an Angre portrait of a woman from the French Empire. It's not Josephine, it's someone else, another, um, another aristocrat. And Paul Poiret was very influenced by that French Empire style. So nearly a hundred years later, he made this dress, which is called the Josephine dress in honor of Josephine, who was Napoleon's empress. The wedge shape is like the totally typical 80s silhouette because of the shoulder pads. So obviously it's wider at the top where the shoulders are and it comes down into a narrower ending. But again, I've shown you a Paul Poiré outfit on the right hand side, that, that amazing cloak with the most beautiful embroidery on it and the most wonderful pattern. So that's a, a very wedge shaped garment, very, very narrow at the hem and much broader at the top. It doesn't have any shoulder seams. It doesn't have shoulder pads. It just goes straight out past the elbows. But the cream suit in the middle is a very typical 19, well, it's very exaggerated, but it's a typical 1980s silhouette. And here are some Claude Montana Silhouette, so you can see on the right, it is for boys as well. Mm. So here we are, fully in the 80s. Now, I don't know who really was more famous, Claude Montana or Grace Jones, but in any case, Claude Montana dressed Grace Jones for her nightclubbing album and subsequent world tour. And she was one of the early exponents of this really quite hyper-masculine silhouette with these enormous shoulders. So Grace Jones is about six feet two tall. That flat cut that she's got, she's really, she was just like a creature from another planet. And she wore this purple, you can't really see that it's purple there, but this purple Claude Montana suit for her tour. And she started on the stage with these enormous steps because her legs were so long that she could just put her, her leg right up on these huge high steps with a piano accordion and this amazing taffeta suit that was so big in the shoulders and right into the waist and then really skinny um, cropped pants. 
but you can see a couple of the other looks here and you can also see that it was definitely for men. And here he is with a group of his models. I couldn't decide how to describe these silhouettes because they're not just wedge silhouettes because they come out again. They're not really normal hourglass silhouettes. I decided they were sort of Y-shaped because when they're standing still, I know all the girls are um, moving and their dresses are fluttering, their pleated skirts are fluttering, but those pleated skirts would look quite tubular when they were straight. And the exaggerated lapels, as well as the exaggerated shoulders and the huge hats just completely amplify and emphasize that triangular bodice shape. So we all know about bustles. So here's a little cage to show you how a bustle used to get put on. So you can see at the bottom, it's got these little hinges on the sides and it actually, and just has a tape to hold it together. It actually used to concertina closed. And then when you wore it, it would just flip out to make the full bustle. Very impractical piece of clothing. And I haven't shown you any Victorian bustle dresses because they're, they're everywhere in the books and I wanted to show you some new exciting iterations of them. So here's a most beautiful 1930s dress. And rather than a bustle, it's got these gorgeous padded sort of bows, aren't they, in taffeta that are completely feather-like, weightless and, and cloud-like, but they give so much volume. And here we are, this is Linda Evangelista in John Galliano. I'm afraid I don't know the date. And this isn't actually a bustle, but you can see, I don't know if you can see, but just above her glove, it's actually a train that's attached from the top of the bodice and comes straight out. Of course, the skirt has also got some padding to make it stick out, which you can see. But the whole effect is just to give the back so much volume. And back fullness doesn't only have to be for evening wear. Here's a very eccentric Comme des Garçons silhouette of a coat that has a whole lot of back fullness coming out below the hips. And on the right, this is from the same series of the tube dress that I showed you earlier, this Comme des Garçons where the back fullness is actually on the top of the bodice. Now, why anyone would want to amplify the roundness of their back is something I don't quite understand and it's not something that has ever happened in commercial fashion because it's sort of the antithesis of what we think of as beauty so this girl has a very flat chest and all of the volume is in her back maybe you could come up with some reasons why I think she maybe was talking about body dysmorphia and and playing with the proportions of the body because she's quite um, antagonistic in that way. Side fullness is something that we don't ever really consider in this way anymore. So this was in the 1700s, these enormous, they were called panniers that stuck out at the side. And pannier is the French word for basket. And I don't think that one on the right does, but I know that some of them used to collapse with the whack of a stick so ladies used to have very big fans and they used to whack them with their fans so that they would get small enough that they could actually get through a doorway i don't think that's going to work in the 21st century so galliano had a bit of a go at at something similar here and alexander mcqueen also had a had a try he made this wooden harness thing that goes on the waist In the 21st century, we're more likely to see that kind of side fullness just in a part of a garment. So for example, these trousers here have got a drape that gives them width at the hips. 
in the center this is Bowman 2021 the the collection that I was telling you about before these amazing double zip pockets that look like almost like targets that are poking right out on the sides of his thighs and this one where again it's like a little tiny mini pannier it looks like tortoise shell so beautiful that's McQueen again And then what about side fullness in the top of the body? The gigo sleeve which, or leg of mutton, gigo means lamb, so leg of mutton sleeves, which are these sleeves that have a huge amount of fullness at the top and then a long, narrow section like a cuff. You can see McQueen's 2019 version of the same kind of sleeve. And then only Vivian Westwood, whoops, sorry, only Vivian Westwood could actually put side fullness on the bottom and do it in such a cheeky and irreverent way and somehow still make it look great. It's like a maid's apron worn on the sides of your bottom. This is the last slide. These are some more extreme silhouettes that are very difficult to categorize. This gorgeous Yoji dress from 2005 has a completely undefined silhouette. Look at the beautiful Swarovski. It's very unusual for him to use that kind of decoration. In fact, I don't think I've ever seen anything as decorative from Yoji before. But these Swarovski crystals just give you this beautiful, slightly asymmetric curved line around her arms. And then the rest of the dress is completely asymmetric, narrow on the on the left as we're looking at it and fuller on the right hand side. The com, the two com outfits, the one on the right isn't actually asymmetric but it's just so exaggerated and so crazy that I wanted to show it to you, really. And the one in the center, again, it's like three different garments have been chopped up and put back together, which is quite likely how it was. And these are conceptual. They're not necessarily for wearing. The Yoji one's definitely for wearing. But these com dresses are really more runway pieces. And what they do is set a mood and give an aesthetic that is really exciting, very hard to digest, so it takes you a long time to think about it and work out what she's trying to say. But then at the end of the day, if you went into the com store, there would be references to these garments, much more pared back and watered down, still pretty eccentric, but a lot more wearable and much more affordable to produce and therefore to sell. So that's all I've got for you today. I want you to really have a look at these silhouettes and start to think about how they got constructed because when we do our class on Wednesday, we're actually going to start playing with some fabric Yoo-hoo, I can't wait. It's so exciting to finally begin. We're going to start with the half-scale dollies and do some pinning on them to start to actually feel how it is to construct a shape on a, on a body form. And that is the beginning of really learning how to design. So I'm looking forward to seeing you then. And yep, take care. Bye.